Welcome to the Celtic Myth Pod Show, bringing the tales and stories of the ancient Celts to your fireside. Episode 54, The Assembly of the Wondrous Head. Hello, I'm Gary. And I'm Ruth. Welcome to the 12th and final episode in the saga of Branwen. And we've got the contact details coming up for you a little bit later. But before we do, I'd like to let you know where you can find the show notes for this episode. And you can find those at CelticMythPodShow.com forward slash assembly. Smashing. Now, do we have any news and views? Yes, we do. This is the last episode in the saga of Branwen. And this brings us to the end of the season. Oh, I know. End of the season. Well, that means we're going to have to take a break and write the next season of shows. Yes, we will. This last season had a weekly release schedule because of our affiliation to the Centre for Pagan Studies and the Doreen Valiente Foundation. But once our new shows are prepared, we'll go back to monthly releases again. That'll be good. Get back to normal. Yeah. And we'd also like to give a huge welcome to all the new listeners that have joined us. We hope you've been enjoying the shows. It's good to have you aboard. Well, while you're waiting for the next branch, if you'd like to go back and catch up with our story, or indeed any of the 97 episodes covering the Irish Book of Invasions and, and the special shows featuring music, interviews, history and folklore, then you can find all of our previous shows at www.celticmythpodshow.com forward slash episodes, or of course on your favourite podcatcher. Even though we're not releasing shows, you can still catch up with us on social media or by email at CelticMythShow at gmail.com. Before we get there, though, we were thinking of bringing you a special show or two. How does that sound? I That sounds good to me. So keep an eye out for a special show coming soon. We'll start putting that together very shortly. That'd be good. But for now, we'd better get on with the final part of our story. Yes. Yes, let's do that. Let's have a reminder of what happened in the last episode. History does not record which of the seven men wielded the mighty blade that struck off the head of the High King, nor which of them placed it upon a silver platter. History does not record the tears that flowed as the gentle and wise head was cut from their brother and liege lord's body. I am with you still, my brothers. I am your king, your brother, and your true companion, although the cost has been great. Take me back to the Isle of the Druids. Let my tears fall upon Innes Mon. Then let it be so. Be at peace, sister. Sleep now. Her eyes, deep blue pools of pain, looked at each of the seven men before her. Memories of her son, her brothers, Bran and the twins, the two mighty armies now crow food lying on the blood-soaked fields of Erin, flooded through her. Woe is me. There is naught but woe within me. I should never have been born. Because of me, two great noble islands have become a wasteland. She gave a great sigh, her heart broke in two and she collapsed onto the ground her life energies passing from her. Hours passed as the boat skimmed across the choppy seas towards the mystical island of Guales in Penvro. The sea was a cold blue-grey that swelled and heeled around them, and the seven sailors were surrounded by a clinging wet mist. Only the severed head of Bran the Blessed kept their course true towards the island. They knew the boat was nearing the island by the size of the roiling and foaming waves that threw the sharp prow of their boat up into the air 
only for them to land with a bone-jarring thump in the valley between the waves. Seabirds wheeled above their heads, puffins, cormorants, gannets and razorbills swooping low over the water in search of silver fish. Rocks began to appear out of the mist, and the seven men quickly pulled down the sail and took to their oars, pulling the boat around, seeking for a safe passage through the grey volcanic rocks that surrounded the island like broken teeth. They were all beginning to tire and despair of ever finding a safe place to land when the sharp eyes of Praderi spotted a narrow beach through a hole in the gap-toward moor that surrounded the island. They pulled hard and made landfall on the rocky beach, quickly leaping from the boat, pulling it high onto the slopes of the coarse grass-covered green hill that dominated the island. After seven long years of feasting and joy in the ancient town of Harlech, the seven brave men who had escaped from Erin, with the head of Bran the Blessed, had now landed on the ancient Druid Isle of Gualis, a land that seemed to fade from one world to another, from our world to the other world. As they trudged up the steep hill, a rich hall began to loom out of the mist, its ancient stone walls glimmering with moisture. The hall was large, fair and regal, and sunshine streamed in through the high windows. A long table was heavily laden with food, and half-unseen servants glided about them as they sat down to feast. The silver platter carrying the head of Bran was placed at the head of the table, and his eyes swept slowly over the assembled company. We are here, my friends, and we shall enjoy our company together, free from the pressures and worries of life back on the Isle of the Mighty. The mist seems to have disappeared now, and sunshine is warming up the island outside. It's a soft and gentle light. What's happening to us? We have travelled beyond, my friend, and there is but one simple rule to follow while we are here. And what is that, old man? The elderly Manoedon extended his arm past two open doors and then pointed to a closed and barred door facing southwest. Do you see that closed and locked door over there? That door looks upon Aber Henfelin, facing Cornwall, and we cannot open it. And they set to feasting, that night and many nights after it. If they had feasted well before, they could not remember any food or wine tasting better than that which they ate in the magical realm of Gualis. Their days were spent in fishing, or hunting and trapping, in games and competitions, and their joy was such that they were completely free of care. Of all the grief that they had witnessed or experienced in their long lives, there was no longer any memory or any of the sorrow of the world that troubled them on that island. The light was golden and made their eyes droop towards sleep, and the soft susuration of the waves against the rocks far below them brought dreams of the mighty deep and its wonders into their heads. They swam and sported with dolphins and porpoises. They rested in the sunlight where it was warm and drank by the huge roaring fire in the great hall when it was wet or cold. Eighty years they passed there, having never enjoyed a period of time as carefree or light-hearted as that. Eighty years in the pleasant company of the head of Bran. It was no more irksome to them to be with the king's head than it was as if he had been there himself. And because of this, that time was known as the Assembly of the Wondrous Head. After those eighty years had passed as if in a dream, they were unconscious of having ever spent a time more joyous and mirthful, more pleasant and relaxing. They were no more tired and weary than when they had first arrived on the island, and none could see an end to their joy, and they could not have told anyone how long they'd been there. Having washed and dressed on a bright sunny morning, Hylin, the son of Gwyn the Old, strode about the hall, looking out through the doors and over the sea. The wispy high clouds enchanted him. The sunlight glinting and sparkling on the waters bedazzled him, and the soft sound of the waters soothed him. After a while he grew to wondering what the view would be like from the southwest from this high point within the hall. He remembered the warnings about the view over Cornwall, but could not believe them to be true. Many times he'd gazed out over the southern waters from somewhere else on the island, standing amongst the puffins with the wind in his hair and his cloak flapping about his legs, and so he said to himself, 
Shame on my beard if I don't open that door and find out whether what is said about it is true. With that decision made, Hylin opened the door and looked out to Cornwall and over Abba Hinvelin. And when he looked, suddenly everything they had ever lost, loved ones and companions, and all the bad things that had ever happened to them, and most of all the loss of their king, became clear to them all, as if it had been rushing in towards them all this time. From that moment, all of their cares, worries, sorrows and grief flooded back through them so strongly that they could not rest. The great sorrowful mouth of Bran the Blessed closed for the last time, and he would say no more. It seemed as if the last of his life, his very connection to the other world, seeped out of him and flew away with the wind from the southwest that came in through that open door. His words came back to them in dim echo from times long gone by. Take the head and bring it to the White Hill in London and bury it with its face towards France. You must make for London and bury the head. Those seven worthies took up their precious burden, sailed back to the mainland and began the long journey to Llindine. There they sought the White Hill and buried the head deep within it, the first raven ever to settle on the hill. As the head was covered, a spring broke through the ground to the north, and as Bran had foretold, no invader ever came to the island of the mighty from across the sea while his head stood guarded. That was one of the three fortunate concealments. And yet Arthur, the once and future king, uncovered and disclosed the head of Bran in later years, because it did not seem right to him that the island should be defended by the strength of anyone lest it be his own. Arthur's disclosure of the head was later known as one of the three unfortunate disclosures. So we come to the end of the tale about the seven who returned from their journeyings in Ireland. It is said that in Ireland none were left alive except five pregnant women in a cave in the Irish wilderness. To those five women, after the same amount of time, were born five sons. They raised those five boys until they were fully grown youths, and they thought about the women and desired to take them, and then each slept as they chose with the mother of his companions and ruled the country and inhabited it, and divided it between the five of them, and because of that division the five parts of Ireland are still so called. And they searched the country wherever there had been fighting, and they found gold and silver, enough to make them all wealthy. Having heard of the blow given to Branwen, which was one of the three grievous beatings of this island, and of the assembly of Bran, when the men from five and seven score districts came to Ireland to revenge the beating of Branwen, and about the feast of Harlech, and the singing of the birds of Rhiannon, and the assembly of the wondrous head which lasted for four score years, we come to the end of the second branch of the Mabinogi. That brings us to the end of the second branch of the Mabinogi, Branwen, daughter of Llir. What an amazing story this has been. And an amazing journey for us. Has been really, hasn't it? Yeah, it really has. And then to suddenly release them weekly, which was fine because of the lockdown and everything else that was going on and we kind of wanted to help and help support the community. Um so it's it's all been sort of up in the air, hasn't it really? It's been very strange. It has been odd. But we hope people like the like the story and the show. Now, do we have anything else? Well, we don't really, apart from the little piece of music at the end. But just like to mention that if you'd like to support our show and help us while we write the next shows, please come along and visit us at patreon.com forward slash Celtic Myth Podcast. Every donation is really appreciated. It enables us to keep our shows free and available to everyone. And that brings us sadly to the end of the episode, so it is time for some music. What have we got? Well, let's leave with an introduction to the third branch from the incomparable Dave the Bard. He's just released a double album of wonderful story and music covering the events of the third branch of the Mabinogi. Full details in the show notes at celticmythpodshow.com slash assembly. So, relax, settle back, 
and enjoy listening to Dave the Bard with These Hollow Hills once more from his album The Third Branch. And we'll be back with you in our forthcoming special episode. So we wish you many blessings. Take care of yourselves. We'll be back soon. And say, Hulvaur. What possessed me to make that suggestion? I thought at the time it was free will. But hindsight is a powerful thing. And of course I soon understood that it was once more the influence of Anun gently guiding my fate as it always had done.
That was how it was. You have been listening to the Celtic Myth Pod Show. If you enjoyed listening to this show, please come and support us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Celtic Myth Podcast. We hope you'll stay tuned for the next episode. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at CelticMythShow at gmail.com or come and chat to us on social media. All of the links are on our contact page on our website at CelticMythPodShow.com. We'd also like to send out a big shout of thanks to Coolands Hounds for our theme music and that's available at SFHounds.com. This show is a Celtic Myth Show production.